Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. Give everyone a chance to come on in. I can't believe it's already December. Goodness. All right. So welcome again. My name is Laura Hoffman and I am the program manager of the Lunder Conservation Center at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, also known as SAM for short. This is the final conservation program just of 2020. So don't worry, just of 2020. Um, so I get to always say the art doctor is in. So a little bit about this program in case this is your first time is that this is a monthly series in which we have a dialogue with a different conservator from our lab. And since your camera and mics are off, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature. I'll be your host and moderator, and we will get to as many questions as we can. And so this is just a different type of program because it's not the type where we're going through a presentation. It really is guided by your questions. So if you have attended before, you know, I always like to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, but I promise I will keep it very brief. So first, keep the internet browser open, and after the program, you'll find a survey, so please fill that out at the conclusion. And as a reminder, this program is being recorded, but only the panelists' audio and camera will show up. Our wonderful intern, Armando Rivera, is working behind the scenes in case you have any technical issues, so please, you can message him in the chat box should any issues arise. We also have closed captioning, so please use the CC option at the bottom of your screen to take advantage of this offering. Now, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here in Washington, DC, the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands the museum is gathered, and the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing Sam's historic building. Now, a little bit about the Lunder Conservation Center at the museum. It's the first visible art conservation lab on permanent display at the museum, and we showcase our conservation methods to the public. So my role is to offer programs in person and now online. So tonight I'm delighted to be joined by our objects conservator, Leah Bright, who will be discussing folk and self-taught art. So Leah, can you get us started and just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to be the objects conservator here at SAM? Sure, thanks, Laura. So as Laura said, I'm an objects conservator, which basically means I help take care of the three-dimensional artworks here at SAM. And let's see, I guess if I start from way back, I always had an interest in art and I always love to make things and just do things with my hands. So I always thought I wanted to do something hands-on. I attended the University of Oregon for undergrad where I studied Spanish and art history. And then after that, I knew I really wanted to dedicate myself to art conservation. And so I had to take some prerequisites like chemistry and organic chemistry and fine art. Um, and I also did some work with um, arts organizations and museums in Los Angeles and back in my home state of Alaska. And eventually I ended up down here in the Washington DC area um, where I was a pre-program intern here at SAM um, for a couple of years and also at the Fear and Sackler Gallery in the Hershorn before I went to graduate school at the Winter University of Delaware program in art conservation. I love um, when it's full circle like that. Full circle. <laughs> You'll see some photos in my presentation of little baby Leah from crew program. <laughs> um, yeah, and so after graduate school, I was a Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Indian before taking a job here at SAM. So that's probably more info than you wanted, but that's my story. 
We like it all. Um, so I know there's a lot that we could be talking about, but specifically we chose to talk about folk and self-taught art here at the museum. And I think some people may be more familiar than others. So could you just briefly describe what folk and self-taught art is? Yes, excellent. That's a good place to start. So there really are no universally agreed upon definitions of these categories. And over time, they've become more and more blurred. Um, but so, folk, I would say, mix them up, but folk and self-taught are considered more neutral terms than other words like outsider, vernacular, intuitive, and visionary art. Um, and we try to be as specific as possible when talking about artists that we've put in these categories. Um, and I think it's more effective to talk about some examples when defining these terms. So we have um, some, a large collection of quilts um, at the American Art Museum from the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And these generally fit in the category of folk art. So folk art is generally used to describe works of art that were created within a specific tradition, often incorporating symbols and techniques that have been passed down. Um, and quilts fall in that category. And they also show how artists could create something within a tradition, but incorporate their individual vision and creativity. Um, and another example that I have, oh, here's how we um, store quilts that are in the collection, just to give you a little conservation taste. Um, we store them rolled so they do not have folds and creases that then can become tears. And these are actually, these were in our visible storage area that's the loose center. But another example are duck decoys. And I really just love duck decoys, so I really wanted to give them a shout out. I think they're very charming. Um, they're also a pretty good example of folk art as they fit within a very specific passed down tradition, but often convey individual points of view and individual styles. And all of these examples, the quilts and the duck decoys are on view at the museum right now. Um, so hopefully we will open back up soon and you can go and see them. Oh, uh, Leah, quick question before you move on. First of all, I just want to say I love doing these programs just to learn things like you love duck decoys. I don't <laughs> know if that normally would come up in conversation. So that's just a wonderful I mean, detail. How can you not? I, they're delightful. Um, but we did just get a quick question before we move forward um, sure. about the quilts and yeah. the storage. So question is, if they're rolled up, don't they warp into rolls? So maybe just really quickly, I know we'll be focusing more on treatment, but that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, generally, no, the materials that are used to make the quilts often are malleable enough in that they don't stiffen into that rolled shape. Um, and I think even if they did take on a little bit of a rolled shape, for us, that would be better than um, if they were folded, um, which we always say a fold becomes a crease, becomes a tear. So we really want to reduce those as much as possible. And if you have something like quilts at home and you can only have the space to fold them, then I would encourage you to try to pad out those folds with something like an acid-free tissue or even like a cotton, clean cotton cloth to help reduce creases. Yeah. And these ones actually, they look like the quilts themselves are exposed to light, but those are actually photographs large photographs of the quilts that are on the rolls to try to show what's there. We also just got another question before you move on from this one, sure. where it says, in the photos of quilts and storage, those are photos of quilts on the outside, whereas the quilts are rolled between tissue. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So one of the main vulnerabilities of quilts is light damage, because they're often made with things like organic dyes they can fade in light pretty quickly. So we try to keep them out of light. Um, and so they're actually, we cycle them in and out of the galleries with pretty relative frequency. And we have um, a contract um, textile conservator, shout out to Julie Brennan, who always does this for us. Um, so yes, that's a long answer to the question, but yes, those are photographs to show what's on the rolls. Also, you're going to be excited about this, getting a couple oh of questions about duck decoys. Uh -oh. uh, so before I get that, um, 
one person asked if we have a photo of where the decoys are in storage, but I don't think that's in, that's not in the visible storage part of loose, right? Oh man, that's a good question. I don't have one today. I can't, I don't think we have any duck decoys in loose at the moment. So that's um, a good question. We're going to have to, we're going to have to dig into this so we can yeah. see more of those. I think decoys. we actually, we don't have a lot of them in the collection. So even some that are on display are often loans to us. And one other question about the duck decoys is that there are the decoys completely made from scratch or are they modified from mass produced versions? I don't know if you know that. Oh, wow. Either. I do not know that. I don't know about these specific pieces. I don't know actually much about their histories. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Perhaps yeah. this is going to be a future converse with a conservator yes. specifically on duck decoys for you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a great question for our curator, Leslie Umberger. She would know more. And we had another question just more broadly about um, air control in, in storage. You know, you, when you were looking at the one in loose, um, that's all pretty con climate controlled, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the air in the museum is pretty tightly controlled. And we have little data loggers in those cases in loose to make sure that nothing bad happens, that we can catch really quickly if the temperature or the relative humidity goes out of a safe range. And we also, in open storage like that at the museum, we try to keep things that aren't as sensitive and that don't need to be in such a controlled environment. Um, breaking news. Breaking news. About the ducks. <gasps> Ariel O'Connor, our our co oh, your fellow objects <laughs> conservator says there are some duck decoys in loose and the black duck is there. So she provided a link. So I will put that in the chat box. Oh, perfect. But I know there's a lot more under this and someone asked a question about, about craft um, and thinking about that. So Keep talking a little bit about this nuances between um, folk and self-taught and then kind of how craft falls within that as well. That's a super great question. Yeah, I was kind of hoping someone would mention that um, in these different categories. So I'm just gonna move on. I have lots of, there's so much to talk about, um, but I'm glad everyone's excited about duck decoys. What a surprise. Um, so the other part of this general category is self-taught artists are surprised generally individuals who did not receive any kind of formal artistic training. And sometimes they often didn't explicitly set out to create art or even consider themselves artists. And the work of James Hampton that we will explore later is a particularly excellent example. Um, but I really, um, this is all kind of self-serving because I also really enjoy the work of Simon Sparrow who's pictured here. And I think he actually did consider himself an artist. He was um, a painter early on in his life. Um, he was actually born in West Africa um, to an African father and a Cherokee mother, and they moved to North Carolina when he was only two. Um, and he lived in Philadelphia for a while before going to New York. Um, and after he kind of stopped painting, he started creating these assemblages of found materials. Um, lots of jewelry and glitter and beads and all kinds of paint. Um, and I think they exemplify well what um, someone who didn't have a lot of artistic training but had this desire and innate kind of drive to create. Um, and you can see that there's a lost bead and some minor corrosion on that bracelet. Um, but I would not replace, I'm not thinking that I would replace that bead because uh, I don't really know what was there and um, that's part of the life journey of the artwork. Um, and this piece is actually in the lab right now. So if it were open, you could see it on our table. It is started to go on exhibition in the next couple of years. So I'm making sure it's really well documented and all of the elements are stable before it's displayed. And great, you had mentioned a little bit about the Hampton throne and yeah. we are getting a couple questions about that. Oh um, so whenever you're ready. That's the next slide. <laughs> All right, let me go down in my notes. 
So this is kind of the most, I would say iconic in the centerpiece of the folk and self-taught art collection, um, because partly it was the first piece that was acquired. And so the full title, we frequent, frequently call it the, just the Hampton Throne for short, but its full title is The Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's Millennium General Assembly. Laura, should we do our poll now? We definitely should do this yeah. poll. All right, you're gonna see this is just a fun question to test your knowledge looking at this picture here, this whole installation, all right. Are we ready? One hot tip, they're not all of the pieces of the Hampton throne are on display. So it's so, not only what you see in this photo, but oh, oh, here we go. This is so exciting. I know it's so fun to see the poll question come in and come the results. So we'll give everyone just a moment to cast their vote. It's great because we can see the little numbers go up. Yeah, wow. You have a leg up if you've seen it in person, but even if not, even if you have, I think it's tricky to guess. I'm always very bad at estimating that, you know, when you guess the jelly beans in, uh, in a bottle. Totally. So, okay, so let's, I'm gonna close it okay. and let's launch it and see, and then you can let us know. So Leah. All right. Public so think. The, the majority of 90. people said, yes, the largest number. So that was a trick. It is actually approximately, there are 180 pieces that make up the entire throne complex. And about a third of those are on display right now. Um, yeah, so it looks like so many pieces on display, but in fact, it's only a third of what we have, which is pretty remarkable. Um, okay, should I close this, Laura? Oh, yes, you close okay. and everyone can close it out. I, oh, I gotcha. unlaunched it. So yes, if it's still in your way, good question. Please get rid of it so we can learn a little bit. So with this piece being 180 pieces, I am very curious, you know, just to learn a little bit about what this piece is, how it came into our collection. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we have, let's see some really amazing archival photos um, that came into the collection with the work. So I'm just gonna kind of go through those while I tell you a little bit about James Hampton and his work and how it came into the museum. So James Hampton was born in South Carolina um, in 1909. And uh, he came to DC when he was only 19 to live with his brother. Um, but then he joined the army and he traveled around Hawaii, he went to Guam, Seattle, and Texas before coming back to DC. Um, and he, after coming back from the army, he worked for the General Services Administration as a janitor from 1946 to 1964, um, when he sadly passed away from stomach cancer. So this is him actually with the work. Um, and he is said to have shown his work, he was kind of, there's a lot of mythology built up around his life um, and particularly that he was kind of a loner and didn't have a lot of people in his life when he came back to DC. Um, but these were some photos that someone took and he is said to actually have shown quite a few people the throne complex. Um, and these photographs were in the garage that he rented, which if you're from the DC area, you might recognize this area on the map that's close to the convention center. And it's actually only, it's probably just like a 10 minute walk to the museum. So Hampton rented this garage in downtown DC where he lived and then worked on this throne complex um, for about 14 years, as I said. Um, so let's see, these are some photos of, so when he passed away, um, the landlord of his garage eventually found the throne complex in the garage. And he immediately thought that it was a really remarkable work and that something that a man had spent so many years working on should not just be thrown away. So he contacted the Washington Post. And um, at this time, the American Art Museum was the National Collection of Fine Arts. And Harry Lowe was the man who was the director at that time. And these are some really amazing photographs of Mr. Lowe in the garage. 
Um, and here is Henry Lowe with the pieces. Um, and he is quoted as saying, when he entered the garage, it was like opening King Tut's tomb. I can imagine with all of the color, all of the foils and all those elements, it would be pretty overwhelming. Um, so the work immediately received quite a lot of attention. There were a couple of stories in the Washington Post. Um, and in 1970, it was officially acquired by the museum. And these are just some more photos of the work in the garage from that time period. I imagine a garage is not necessarily the ideal place for a conservator to have artwork being stored in. Definitely, yes. Ideally, we prefer conditions that are pretty stable in temperature and humidity, not a lot of pest activity. And I would assume that this garage was likely kind of the opposite of those conditions. But um, remarkably, it remains in okay condition. Um, it did receive quite a lot of um, conservation treatment early on when it was at the museum. Um, and I can talk some more about his materials in a second, but um, he really didn't use any screws. So structurally he used like straight pins and small nails and he created these bridges with cardboard and adhesive. So to move these pieces around would have been pretty easy to damage them. Um, so some of the early conservation treatments were probably what today we would think would be kind of upsetting and really invasive. They added a lot of nails and or screws, excuse me, and additional pieces of wood to make sure that the pieces were all stable because um, they were actually loaned quite a bit early on. Um, and let's see, just show some more photos. There's a wide range of different sized elements from this large throne and these winged elements to medium stands. Um, and all of these pieces um, correlate with different parts of um, the Bible. And um, he, let's see, they are situated in parallel rows and that throne was the kind of the focal point. Um, and objects on the right hand side represent the New Testament and Jesus and on the left, the Old Testament and Moses. And, and that, that, that brings up a question that I just wanted to mention here is, um, I know we always talk about artist intent mm -hmm. in conservation. And so one question that came up is, do you know why the artist made this particular work and the significant significance of it? So I feel like you're, so I just wanted to pull that out because I felt like that was a really good question tying in exactly with what you were going for. Yes, good question. Excellent question. So yes, I think it's related to his religious beliefs. And I think his ultimate goal was to have some kind of ministry where he could preach from this central pulpit and then from that throne that I show. Um, yes. And he also, let's see, uh, made small elements like these crowns and plaques that you saw on the wall. And he also had a lot of writings, um, kind of an unknown script in lots of notebooks. And he, so he had a lot of archival materials as well. Um, which included those photographs that I showed first. So some questions about when you had, you're talking now a little bit about some of the materials. Yeah. Um, and there's a question about the screws that you had mentioned. Um, they're curious about thinking about the screws being added to the Hampton throne. And that's kind of considered a more aggressive conservation intervention. So how has the conservation practices changed over the years when looking at a piece like this, which has been in our collection for quite some time? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think what it comes down to is today, we are often more focused on the intangible components and meaning of an artwork. So not only the material components, but what they represent and what they mean that's not only what you can see or what you can feel. Um, so generally we would not, because Hampton originally did not have these materials on hand and his kind of ingenious use of things like pins and cardboard straps. That's a really kind of powerful illustration of his 
skill and imagination. Um, so I think nowadays we probably, we wouldn't do something as aggressive as adding screws and new pieces that weren't there to begin with, because that would kind of take away from his original, his original plan and his original skill. Um, some also in those early stages of treatment, they add, actually added foil in some places that were really um, in poor condition. Um, and now we really want to kind of respect the history of the artwork and not only what it looked like when it was first created, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, you mentioned that too, because another question that came in is asking about specific religious purposes that the artist that um, Hampton had created this for. So, are there ethical issues in displaying this kind of artwork in the museum, and/or when you're you're mentioning the intangible, um, especially with folk and self-taught, are there any? know complications or considerations for this type of work definitely yeah absolutely especially with him having passed before anyone from this kind of institution could talk with him about it um yeah it certainly is not that this was not the artist's intent at all so in some ways it's kind of like well how can we say that we're doing this ethically um but i think i mean ideally this work would still be displayed in its original setting and it would be used in some kind of religious capacity. Um, but I think for it to be preserved, it, you know, I think that garage, the landlord couldn't keep it in its garage and um, the museum had to do something with it. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of additional research that could be done to pinpoint more about his um, beliefs and his plans for the throne. But it's generally understood that he wanted it to be displayed and he wanted people to see it and learn about it. Um, so that's like a little bit of a consolation for me to think that he hopefully would have liked this. Um, but yeah, I hope that makes sense. And, and I mean, in case people haven't seen it, I mean, it really does have this spiritual effect when you see it in the museum it, it's so large and there's so much grandeur and it really just envelops you like that that's what I the first thought when I came in for the first time yeah it is really it's really impactful and especially when you think that it's not even all of the pieces it's really a pretty small part there was a question about that about if the museum would ever have the entire installation up at one time, or if not, what kind of considerations go into that? Yeah, I think there have been several, or I think four different iterations of the throne on display. And I think it really generally comes down to space and what is stable enough to be displayed. Um, our current conservator, Leslie Umberger, she only came on at the museum in 2012. So I think her, she would really like to reimagine the display and to hopefully add more components um, to do more research and to really rethink um, how the museum interprets the piece. But it's really just a, an issue of time and um, that would take a lot of time from conservation, from registration, from curatorial. So it's really just making sure that we can all collaborate together and do that. But yes, hopefully at some point there will be more pieces on display. Now there's a lot of, I, you had mentioned some of the foils and I was hoping maybe you could go into some detail because we're getting a lot of questions about these different materials and sure. what they more specifically are and how they've aged. Yes, yeah, I think for me, these are kind of some of the more fun details, particularly about being a conservator because when we're doing cleanings of the pieces, you're able to see in detail elements that you wouldn't be able to see. Um, so like these pieces, he used a lot of cardboard and maps and things that he would have found at his job at the General Services Administration. Like on the left, there's um, is a chalkboard. This is property of the State Department. And he used all kinds of foils, like just regular household aluminum foil, which you can see this is a tag that's from a roll of Reynolds wrap that says six feet left, order now, which is really cool. Um, and it seems like he also used um, tin foil from liquor store displays and candy wrappers and other kind of food wrappers, really just anything that he could find. 
he used electrical, electrical conduits like this to create rounded edges. It seems like his goal was really to transform all of these everyday objects into something really extraordinary. He used furniture and he would cut it, take the drawers out of dressers, um, yeah, jelly jars. Um, here's some of the textured foils that maybe came from some kind of decorative display. A lot of light bulbs, obviously that silver toned foil, but also gold toned foils. Um, and currently you see a lot of browns like here, but originally I think a lot of those elements would have been colored that you can see on the right. Um, he used a lot of craft papers that are really light sensitive. Um, so we think that even possibly during his lifetime when he was working on it, they had probably already faded. Um, but in some areas that are really, that are hidden, like up under pieces, you can see those bright colors. It's really cool. And here's some other examples of those colors. Um, and to speak more about conservation issues, so he also used plastics. He would put sheets of plastic over the front large faces of the elements. And we're not sure if that was to create more shininess or to try to protect the elements. Maybe he was already seeing degradation in his garage and wanted to protect them. That's hard to say. Um, but this is a detail just showing some of that plastic. We think it's cellulose acetate that is starting to curl and it's quite dusty and getting pretty brittle. And so you can imagine that would be something difficult to dust and clean without snagging it. And you can also see some discolored paper behind there. Um, a lot of the foils are, some of them are in pretty good shape. Aluminum is inherently pretty stable, um, but in some places there's some corrosion um, and lost and starting, foil that's starting to degrade, particularly because it's very thin in some places. There's a lot of foils, particularly gold ones that were backed with paper, and those have not fared particularly well. Um, you can see the photo on the left here. Um, along these edges are where you would grab the piece if you were trying to move it. So those areas in particular are really vulnerable to damage. Um, oh, and this is some, so one of the past conservators, Helen Ingalls, did a really incredibly impressive amount of research into the conservation of foils. And she, with the help of scientists at the Museum Conservation Institute, found that the coating on some of the gold tone foils was actually cellulose nitrate, which is what we call a malignant plastic, meaning that as it degrades, it can off gas and cause other things to um, degrade as well. Um, so that was, she found on some of those gold foils. And unfortunately we can't really stop those degradation processes from going forward. So we try to document everything as well as we can to keep the environment, the temperature and humidity as stable as possible um, and to make sure we keep things like dust off of the pieces, which you can see here's one of those little baby Leas and um, my friend Gabby doing some vacuuming of the pieces in 2012, which at this time we moved the pieces from that display area um, into the galleries to clean them easier. Because that's actually one of the largest challenges is on display, all the pieces are really close together. So it's hard to effectively clean them without bumping into other pieces. Yeah, I've seen this be done where you put on like little booties and the backpack has, it's it, in order to, to move around with a vacuum, it almost looks like a Ghostbusters. Indeed. Right, yes. so you can be really careful about it. And of course you have to do it before hours because you can't do it, you have to be so careful. <laughs> yeah. And so sometimes we'll just use like a really soft bristle brush and then brush some of the dust onto like a Swiffer um, if we don't have the time or space to carry a vacuum into that space. Um, but as you can see here, the throne was quite dusty at this time and we were using a screen to vacuum through to try to reduce the vacuum picking up any of the original textile fibers, just the dust. Um, and here's me and Helen. Um, cleaning some other elements, but using little soft sponges. Like I have some ooh, right here. They don't look very exciting, but they're just really soft sponges, basically like similar to ones that we, you would use to apply makeup. So if they're, they're really nice and soft and don't hurt your face 
And so similarly, we like to use them on artwork so they are not abrading. Often, sometimes dusting and cleaning can cause additional abrasion and damage. So we try to use materials to clean that are softer and won't um, abrade the original surfaces. Um, and here's another time the elements on display were moved to clean and document them more in depth. Um, and these were, this is in a kind of a conference room in the museum. Um, they were moved into that area to be photographed and cleaned. Can I ask you a quick question? And because this is followed in here, there's a couple questions from people here about how you would go about moving these different components safely. It is, it is, that's one of the main challenges actually. Um, they have, most of them have old, it seems like Hampton put casters on the bottom. So they have little wheels, probably from chairs that he found in the office, um, but they're not in great condition and a lot of them don't roll very well. Um, and as you could probably tell, some, a lot of the foils and decorative elements are really pretty delicate. Um, so it's really just you move them very carefully and you always have to use at least two people to handle the larger ones. I, this is the time where I usually would say if I were doing a tour, don't try this at home. You exactly. <laughs> skilled hands for moving and of course wearing gloves and things like that. Yes, yeah. And so we're super lucky to have a staff of really skilled registrars and art handlers and exhibits, exhibits people who do this as moving things carefully as their bread and butter. So <laughs> um, let's see what else I have. Oh, look, that's perfect timing. <laughs> um, yeah, so moving things is definitely one of the main challenges, particularly because they are so displayed so close together. Um, so this is some of them getting moved back onto display after cleaning. Um, we have a couple of questions about replacing of different elements. Um, yeah, people asking about the foil or as well as the bulbs that you had mentioned, the light bulbs. So could you talk a bit about what your approach is on those? Um, well, now I don't think we would ever at this point replace any elements. As I was saying earlier, we, we really don't wanna erase the history of the work being in a kind of uncontrolled environment that may have caused some damage. If a piece of foil is about to fall off, we would likely use some kind of adhesive, excuse me, some kind of adhesive to put, put a lifting piece back down if it was about to fall off. But as much as possible, we try to just use preventive measures to keep the work in better condition. Yeah, so I don't think, I mean, never say never, but generally we would not do any kind of replacement said, I know that um, some of the elements are what we like to call exhibition copies. Could you explain That's true. What, what that is? Yes, yes, good, good segue. <laughs> um, so this is just some of the photography setup. Um, and this is a photo of a detail showing some of the tags that are on the pieces that are labeling, each of them are named with, um, someone that Hampton, it seems like he had visions of these people, and so they're named with those individuals. Um, but as you can see, some of them are really close to where the public would be able to approach the piece. And so those thrones, or those thrones, those tags could be easily touched or removed or pulled on. So um, this was not when I was here, but an amazing intern in a urson call made a set of facsimiles, which are basically exact copies. Um, using archival materials, she made some replacement tags um, in case the tags were messed with or removed so that the originals wouldn't be the ones that were damaged. Um, you can see they're pretty much, they're so difficult to tell which one is the original and which is the facsimile. She did a really incredible job. I'm mean, gonna actually have a little example here that another intern, Nicole Chasse, made and some amazing a little storage housing that um, this is not a real, one of the real tags. Anna actually made two sets of facsimiles. 
Um, and then Nicole made the storage housings to make sure that the originals could be just stored in a really safe and archival way. So I guess you're right, we do have some replacement elements on, <laughs> um, but they're really clearly labeled what they are. So for us, they don't really remove any of the um, history of the piece. And I think with that, just from from what I know with this piece and is that it it's more of a safety element because it's so close to where the visitors are. It's it's more about the safety of the piece than yeah. necessarily, you know, another reason for replacing it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not necessarily a condition issue, but just a, a preventive technique. That yeah. being said, a question that was asked is, are the pieces safer in storage or on display? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, oh man, that's a tough one. I think that is kind of the age old question of the conservator. Um, and you really have to think about what your priorities are. Um, and if, I mean, sure, these would probably be safer if we kept them in the dark in really nice archival boxes but then we would completely lose any kind of public access to them. Um, and as conservators, that's really, our goal is to improve access for the public to new perspectives and um, powerful works of art. So even if inherently it might be a little bit safer, um, I think providing access is really the main goal. Right, and that's where it kind of goes back to the artist's intent, right? If the artist's intent is for the piece to be shown, then you have to balance it, but put it in the safest way possible. So, Absolutely. you know, it's it's job security for you in a way. Yes, good point. <laughs> um, a quick question about the, the foil a little bit is, are the foils, I don't know if you talked about how they're attached, if there is like a glue or an adhesive, or are there any parts of it that have glue, if not the foil component? Yes, he used all of the glue. Helen did analyze quite a bit of his adhesive, and she found everything that she tested was a hide glue. I don't really think that any of my photos illustrate the adhesive, but um, hide glue can kind of constrict when it dries. So um, he, and he used that to both with those cardboard tabs, he would connect different elements of the furniture with adhesive, but he did also use adhesive to put um, some of the foils down. Um, but he also used, he would make little balls of foil and use a pin or a nail to attach that to the furniture or to the substrate. And then sometimes he would put another la layer of foil on top of that, just mechanically kind of bunched on the other ball of foil. Um, so yes, he used quite a bit of adhesive, but not, not everywhere. Oh, and Ariel um, did add in one just interesting tidbit that I yeah. wanted to share, that during the 2016 treatment, one of the crowns that is now on display in the case next to the journal, so it's in a little separated area. I don't yeah. know if you have a picture of that separated area. Mm -mm. Um, had torn foil on top of the light bulb and curator Leslie Umberger asked the, the conservators not to fix the tear because you could see the light bulb was red from an old oh. photography dark room. Whoa. So, so Ariel said that you, they only fix things that needed structural repairs. So yeah. that was something that's a really kind of, cool that's an amazing thing. anecdote. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Generally, unless the integrity the kind of physical integrity of a piece is, is at risk, then we would do some kind of interventive treatment, but yeah, that's really cool. That's a great one. So uh, we are, we only have a couple minutes left. There've been a lot of questions about the artist, James Hampton. I put in the chat box, a bunch of different parts of different links. So please oh, click on those to learn about them. Mm -hmm. um, we probably have time for just one or two more questions. I found a question that um, I really liked to wrap things up a little bit is that you mentioned that folk and self-taught art at the beginning were a little hard to define. And are there any artists or pieces that to you blur that line? Um, 
That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, um, I mean, I think they kind of often they kind of all do that and they aren't, I think, placing a category or naming an artist like that is kind of inherently problematic because they didn't choose that category for themselves. Um, so I think none of the artists really fit perfectly into any category. Um, a lot of the folk art in our collection was created by artists that we don't know who they were. Um, but yeah, that didn't I mean, really answer the question. But. No, I do. I actually think that does answer the question that th this is a, a category from the museums, not necessarily from artists themselves. So right. it is messy and it is blurry. And as you said, it's really about looking at the individual artist and artwork and the artist intent, not so much being stuck on necessarily the labels, right? Is that what? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I think in some ways it also speaks to issues of just the museum and art world in general and thinking about thinking critically about who are the people in power creating these categories and putting these labels on artists. Um, but so I think in an ideal world, we probably wouldn't have these categories and they would all just be artists and American artists who contributed to American art history in a really impactful way. Um, but I think we can use these categories to really think critically about what we consider art and creativity and how we might ourselves privilege one style over another. And um, just if we, you know, really let our own creativity blossom, what could we create if we just went for it? So, yeah. Well, wonderful. All right, so it is 6.15. So I wanna be mindful of the time. Thank you, Leah, for a wonderful yeah. program. Oh, I had one more thing I wanted oh, to- Oh, great. Wanted in my head, I was like, I have to say this that um, I really just want to shout out our all of the first line employees at the museum, like all of our guards and the janitorial staff who, unlike we've had the privilege of staying home for a lot of the pandemic, but they've had to go in every day and um, are really the heroes of keeping the collection safe. Um, so yeah, if they don't get enough credit then yeah. So if you see them say thank you. Um, yeah. Excellent point. A big thank you for exactly all of our essential workers to Leah. Thank you for joining us today. I put in the link. The survey should automatically pop up if you're having issues with it from the chat. Um, I also put in a link for the next Converse with the Conservator, which is going to be on January 6th, and it's all going to be about paintings care. So thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.